Life in Ireland back in the 1900s was very different to what it is today. Life was full of drudgery. Ireland still would have been very much an agricultural country, very dependent on the land for its resources. The reality for most people was that they had absolutely no access to electricity. There was no access to running water. They were probably lucky if they were able to take a bath one day a week. People would have had to walk to the local well and it was really up to women and young children to do the domestic chores. So really, really difficult times, very physically demanding roles for women at that stage. In the modern world, energy is all around us. It's embedded in the products we use. It is what enables the things we like, like making tea or lights, computers. People who have access to energy have access to freedom. They have access to education. They have the opportunity to improve their standing and their well-being. But there are downsides to energy too. We're more dependent on modern forms of energy than we ever have been before. But there's reason for optimism. Some of the grandest achievements in human history have been enabled on the back of energy. Are you all okay with heights? Good. My name is Alan Bain and I'm the plant manager here in Ardacrusha. This is where the National Electric Grid of Ireland began. What we can see here now is essentially how it would have looked back in the late 20s. So what we see in front of us here now is the Head Race Canal. To your left, to your right is the intake building and further over is the main station then. All energy has to be created from something. So the water is our means of creating the electricity here. We have a fairly abundant water source. We get a lot of rain here. So it's a natural progression to use that then to generate electricity. There's a approximately 30 meter head here. So the dam itself is 30 meters high. So that was one of the main reasons it was built was to focus that head in one area. And here we were just looking up towards the uh, end of the canal. It would have been all farmland at the time. From 1800 up to 1920, it was a very difficult time for Ireland with the famine. The blight that affected the potato crop. We were under the control of the UK at the time, so we weren't in a position to make decisions ourselves. A lot of the crops that we were producing were being exported to the UK. So we had crops being exported while people were starving and dying. Back in 1845, just as famine was breaking out, uh, University College Cork's first president, Sir Robert Kane, had just written a book about industrial progress in Ireland. And effectively this comprised analysis looking at the, the natural resources that were available to Ireland and how they could be harnessed. Water is one of the first forms of energy that we harnessed for industrial purposes. For example, water from mechanical power was an idea that's been around for hundreds of years. Later on, in the late 1800s, the idea of using water for electrical power also came to life. You can use flowing water to spin a turbine, which spins magnets, which generates electricity. So the idea of harnessing water for electrical power started popping up in many places around the same time. That fell on deaf ears. The late 1800s was all about recovery from famine and dealing with the mass emigration and mass deaths that were happening at that time. As the political movement was heading towards thoughts of independence then, that thinking started to re-emerge. One part of independence is getting rid of the oppressor, the other is how do you build a nation. Men of vision, men of action. Dr. Tommy McLaughlin and Mr. Patrick McGilligan. Dr. McLaughlin, I would like to bring you back in time to the middle of 1923. I'd like to ask you, where were you at that time and what were you thinking about? 
I was uh, an engineer in training with Siemens in Berlin. And in mid-summer 23, I was in the water power department. And it was there we started examining data relating to the Shannon. The decision to build Ardenic Russia, it was mainly down to a young gentleman called Thomas McLaughlin. He felt that we should really use the natural resources in Ireland, so he looked towards the River Shannon, the longest river in Ireland, to start generating electricity. Together with his employer Siemens, they drew up a plan to start harnessing the Shannon scheme. Luckily for Thomas McLaughlin, he was also friends with some of the members of the Irish Free State government. The government, most of them, they did like the plans, but it was going to be a huge investment. The scale of expenditure was, was phenomenal. I mean, when the plans were put together, it represented about a quarter of GDP, a quarter of economic activity in a given year. Looking at that through today's lens, the idea of spending a quarter of economic activity as, on one infrastructure project, it wouldn't happen today. While they liked the plans, they did want more study done on it. So they hired an international team of four experts. The experts, they looked at the plans, and it was only with slight modifications that they then introduced the Shannon Electricity Act, and that gave the green light for the building of Ardna Crusher. The detail plan complete, men and equipment from Germany arrive at Limerick docks. There are machines to dig and to scoop and even fashion the slope of the headrace canal. The project was built, but not without difficulty. Back before the building even started, one of the concerns was, interestingly, a political one. There were certain people, of a, there were certain business representatives, and there were several other people, and they didn't like it. And it wasn't merely that they were skeptical about it, they were hostile yes. at the beginning. To give you an idea of how um, careful we were, I never sent a letter through the mail, the ordinary mail. I sent all my correspondence through the German diplomatic bag. Uh -huh. <laughs> Given that this happened very soon after World War I, the UK, who had been sort of uh, controlling Ireland uh, up to independence, were very concerned about the German company uh, being involved in such a big infrastructure project. The year is 1927 and the work is half done. Rivers have had to be diverted, hills cut through, valleys filled in, and roads built. It's 1927, the world takes note, and the people of Ireland come in their thousands to see for themselves. It was the largest engineering project of its time in Europe. While the construction was still ongoing, they started welcoming people to Ardna Crusher for guided tours of the site. And within eight months of opening, 85,000 people had descended on the site, really instilling a sense of national pride and basically for them to buy into the scheme. At the height of the scheme, there were 5,000 workers. And it was really a great collaboration between German engineers and Irish engineers. On the scheme, there was about 1,000 engineering staff and then about 4,000 labouring staff. A lot of them, they just wouldn't have had experience. And because it was such a large construction site at the time, unfortunately, there were some fatalities as well. The people that worked on the scheme, they are very much remembered here. And there is a monument to those who, who lost their lives on the scheme. A real insight that we see into Thomas McLaughlin and his motivation behind the scheme and bringing electricity to everybody in Ireland. He said that no sincere student could have lived through that entire sense of national enthusiasm without doing as much as possible to build the country from within and that he could have no mental peace until he saw the Shannon scheme realised. Ardna Crusher came on stream and was officially opened in July 1929. 
our greatest, our most famous river, is entering upon a new chapter of its long story. Henceforth, the Shannon will be harnessed in the service of the nation, distributing light, heat, and power throughout the Seastot, increasing at once the comfort of our homes and the productive capacity of our farms and factories. So at the moment we're standing at the front of Arden Crusher, the Min building. So to the front of the building you can see lines going out to all the different substations in the different areas and villages, supplying farms, homes, all that kind of. So what we have here is uh, the winch gear for gate number two. So the gate hangs off these chains and basically you can raise or lower the gate using this winch gear. But it's all powered by electric motor. Everything is riveted, there's no welding. Uh, welding hadn't been suitably developed at the time, so everything is riveted together here. From here we can see the three uh, generators. So we have the water coming down the penstocks, goes into the turbine and that rotates the turbine. The turbine is then attached to the generator, which is under those covers uh, via a shaft. And the spinning turbine through the shaft spins the generator. Uh, you have your magnetic field within the generator, which then in turn generates electricity. This is the old control room, as we call it. That's a mannequin, he just represents an, an old control room operator. Adds a bit of life to the place. This was in use up until 1997, when we transferred to the new control room at the other end of the building. Um, you can see all the dials, switches, that were used to run the machines up until then. That's all now essentially two computer screens. Everyone here has a huge pride in the, the place itself because uh, we're very conscious of the fact that this will be here long after we're all gone. So we're all take the attitude that we're maintaining it for the next generation. So they will have a green, uh, renewable supply of electricity. The idea to supply all of Ireland, that was always part of the Shannon scheme. Once it was officially opened, ESB were busy out connecting all the major towns and cities to the national grid. The nature of the terrain varies a good deal in Ireland, and some of the areas are harder to conquer than others. But throughout the 1930s, rural Ireland, they still weren't connected to an electricity supply. However, World War II broke out in Europe. Raw materials were in scarce supply. So while plans were underway, they had to wait for World War II to be over. ESB then embarked on the Rural Electrification Scheme on the 5th of November in 1946. It was a question of, well, how do we actually bring that value to the nation? We need to persuade people to use electricity in order to harness the benefits of it. And that was a huge challenge. I've seen records of letters into newspapers worried about electrocution and the, the great evil. The idea for selling it to the public of Ireland was very much in terms of educating people. So here we have one of our original advertising books. So as you can see here, our advertisements, they were very much aimed at women and also advertising all the electrical appliances that we have for sale in our retail stores. Because life was really difficult, because everything had to be done by hand, it was really seen as the end of drudgery and that by getting electricity into your home, strap lines like electricity will set you free and that you will have a lot more leisure time um, because you will have electricity to do the hard work for you. There was definitely an educational side as well. School children, they would have had to read by candlelight. And there was a real fear there that the literacy of people in Ireland, it would have been declining. So it was all very much about, have you thought about your children's eyesight? So that was very much part of the whole campaign, just to increase the literacy levels as well for women and for children. One of the grand philosophical arcs of energy that's very exciting is what energy does for freedom. 
Energy has a democratizing effect. It is liberating if you get access to it because all of a sudden you can read a book. You don't have to rely on someone else for information. It's because you can study with a light bulb powered by electricity. It's because you have the ability to go to town and participate in your civic elections. Energy has lifted a lot of us out of poverty. We're all richer now because of energy. If you look at what happened subsequently, I mean, we, we, we never really had a huge industrial revolution. Most countries moved from agriculture to industry to services. We largely skipped the industry bit and moved from agriculture to services. I mean, even if we didn't have a lot of industrial manufacturing, people could do things more efficiently, more effectively, more safely, more securely. And those benefits, those societal benefits, were very tangible and very clear. The development of the health system, the education system, you know, it's hard to imagine them being done without electricity. At that time, when Ireland was emerging as a new nation, trying to find its feet, trying to stand proud, stand tall, it was a very bold move, a very significant step in terms of the timing, in terms of the scale, in terms of the ambition, and in terms of what it delivered. It did bring electricity to Ireland. It changed Irish society forever. It was really the country that got behind Ireland and we started generating hydroelectric power. And it's very much an inspiration that we could do that back nearly 100 years ago. And it very much sets the pace for where we want to go by embracing a low carbon future. There's a lot of exciting stuff in the energy world better ways to harness the sun and wind. We're making energy better, we're making it more efficient, and that's a good news story for all of us.